Hi everyone, welcome to week two of our women's summer series. I'm so glad to see all of you out there. And if you haven't yet, check in on the chat thread if you are meeting or using the online group. And those of you who are meeting in group, if you even wanna hop on the chat thread and let us know you're on there, that would be really fun to see you and be able to join together in that way. I wanted to give you a couple of reminders for just some events and some things that are happening this week. So the first thing, last week you heard about the cookbook and we're just really excited that this is going to be in production soon. And so just wanted to remind you, get your recipes in. I think they're hoping to get the recipes in by the end of this month. So you have a couple of weeks, but uh, be getting them in, thinking about what you want to submit. Uh, if you know somebody who makes an amazing dish, then send them a text and say, hey, don't forget to put that in to the cookbook. It really is fun to be able to be cooking out of something and being able to connect with each other uh, as we make each other's dishes. The second thing is that at least right now, we are planning on having our first in-person service this Sunday that's open to anyone by reservation. And so to, uh, today, the email went out with the link to reserve a spot. So if you are one of the people who wants to show up in person on Sunday, just be sure to find that email, access the link, and get signed up for a reservation. There's reservations for both first service and second service. And just to clarify, you will see a reservation for the sanctuary as well as for the gym. The sanctuary, we're assuming, will be uh, what most people want. We are just also offering the gym mostly as overflow uh, if the sanctuary fills up. So either way, uh, we would love to see you if that's something that you feel comfortable and healthy enough for. All right, last thing. Uh, next week, we are tentatively planning on being able to gather in person for the third one of these, uh, the women's series. And so be watching for details on that. We're going to kind of watch and wait and see how the trends go this week. And then we will try and make a judgment by the beginning of next week. So again, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I am just really glad that you've chosen to make time for this. I think we are all in a space where being able to connect with each other one way or another uh, is really helpful. So let me pray for us, and then I will kick us off for the icebreakers. Dear Jesus, we are just so grateful for this time to gather together. And I just pray that you would bless each person and each group that's gathered, that you would just be present, and that this time would be a time where we can settle all of the noise and the static that's in our heart and in our heads and in our ears and really find ways to abide with you, to fill up with more of you. So I just pray that you'd bless our time together. In your name I pray, amen. All right, icebreaker time. I'm gonna give you the next 20 minutes or so uh, to answer these icebreaker questions, or if you just wanna jump in and start connecting with each other, please feel free. But questions, here they are. Are you sad, glad, mad, or afraid? And you can explain that a little bit. And then what do you need from the people that you are with? Or if you're somebody who's online and you're on the chat thread, what do you feel like you're needing right now? Um, it's not quite the same to get it through the chat thread, but there are ways that we can communicate uh, and give to each other, even online. So are you sad, glad, mad, or afraid? And what do you need from the people that you are with? All right, I'll see you in a little bit.
The gardener comes out to tend to his garden. He prunes and shapes the branches in order that the fresh buds may begin to blossom and bear fruit. Some of the branches have completely died. They did not survive the harsh winter. So the gardener removes and throws them away to be burned. He also notices that some branches have become disconnected and they lie dead because they have been severed from their life source. The gardener knows that had he not pruned the branches and removed the dead wood, the plant would not have been able to bear more fruit. It may have flowered a little, but it would never have been able to achieve its full potential for that season. In John 15 we read, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. The true vine. Did you notice that Jesus seemed to want to emphasize what kind of vine he was? And it made me wonder, I wonder why? Why did he need to clarify this? So as I studied this week, I was reminded that Old Testament writers would use the symbol of a vine or a vineyard to symbolize God's people, the Israelites. And Isaiah writes about how Israel was planted as a garden in order to create good fruit. He explains it from God's perspective in chapter five. So you can follow along with me if you have your Bible or you can follow along on the screen. So verse 1b, we'll start there. He says, My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Ouch. He looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. From the very beginning, God's people were chosen in order to produce good fruit. That's what they were for. They were supposed to be the ones planted, in a sense, to yield God's way of doing things, to love their neighbor, or sorry, to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, and strength. And then that would look like loving their neighbor as themselves, fighting for justice for the oppressed. Overall, they were supposed to be a light for the nations, but they just couldn't pull it off. Over and over, we see God's people yielding bad fruit. And so Isaiah continues. He says that God declares that he will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. God says, I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. Verse six says, I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. So when his people couldn't restore the garden, it was time to send the true vine, the one who could right what was wrong. And Isaiah talks about this. He offers hope in chapter 27. You can read with me, starting with verse 2. Isaiah writes, In that day, seeing about a fruitful vineyard, I, the Lord, watch over it. I water it continually. I guard it day and night so that no one may harm it. Automatically, we start to see things that are different. Instead of letting it be destroyed, letting the walls break down, letting people trample in. The Lord says, I'm going to watch over it. I'm going to guard it. He says, instead of commanding the, the clouds to not rain, God says, I will water it continually. Verse four says, I am not angry. If only there were briars and thorns confronting me, I would march against them in battle. I would set them all on fire. God is going to guard this and even go to battle 
for this vine. Verse 5 says, Or else let them come to me for refuge. Let them make peace with me. Yes, let them make peace with me. In days to come, Jacob, Israel, will take root. Israel will bud and blossom and fill all the world with fruit. We get a picture of how the coming vine, the true vine, is going to bring about a very different result. And John gets to write about this when he quotes Jesus as saying, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. The time has come for this prophecy that Isaiah wrote about. John says, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So John and Jesus, and then John writing, is pointing back to the promise in Isaiah. The time has come. The Lord is going to watch over. He's going to water. He's going to do the things in order to create fruit. And isn't it so interesting that God's response to the bad fruit was to stop pruning the plant. And yet here in the promise of the true vine, he commits to the pruning process because as we discovered last week, pruning is what creates even more fruit. So verse three, almost seems like Jesus is changing the topic, changing the subject, because he says, you are already clean because of the word I, had, I have spoken to you. So it's almost a reminder of what Jesus had said just a few chapters before. Now, sometimes when you're reading the Bible, it's hard to keep track of the timeline, but this conversation about the vine and the branches is happening the same day or evening that the Last Supper had happened. And Jesus had started that night by washing his disciples' feet. And so I think John is pointing us back to that. Say, don't forget some of the things that Jesus has taught us when he washed our feet. Because the foot washing, cleaning the feet, referred to two types of cleaning. The first referred to the overall cleaning, how um, our whole selves must be cleaned by Jesus's once for all death and resurrection. And just Jesus refers to this when he tells the disciples that those of you who have had a bath need only to wash your feet because your whole body is already clean and you are clean. Jesus was talking to the disciples who had believed in him and was telling them, you are clean. Your belief in what I'm getting ready to do has cleaned you spiritually. But he also said that they needed to wash their feet. And so at first, that's a little confusing. Why do I need to wash my feet if I'm already clean? And this just refers to the daily clean cleaning, the daily washing. Because in Bible times, people walked on dusty roads to get places. And so when they had gotten there, inevitably their feet and their sandals would be covered with dirt and need to be cleaned. So even though the rest of them would still be fairly clean, their feet would be dirty. I had a similar experience the other day after supper. Uh, I typically ask if anyone wants to go for a walk. And so Chris and I decided to go, but it was super windy. So we decided to drive to this little trail um, a little bit away because it was more sheltered with some trees. Well, this trail happens to be where a railroad track used to be. And if you think of a railroad track, you know that piled up around the tracks are all these this white gravel. And so there is this leftover white gravel on the trail. And so sure enough, I wore my Chaco sandals and by the time I got back, my feet were covered in dust. In fact, when I got back in the car, I left two footprints on the floor mat because I was so dusty. And so when I got home, I had to wash my feet and my sandals. You know, every day, even if we are 
spiritually clean and Jesus has paid the price and made us whiter than snow, we, as we walk through our days, it seems like we pick up the dust that is all around us. I don't know about you, but I can start my day super clean, but by the end of the day, I've picked up some frustration, some defensiveness, some impatience. I've engaged in all my bad habits <laughs> and I just feel a little bit dusty. And that's why every day we need to take time to clean our hearts, to clean our minds, to purify our inner life. And I think that's why Jesus, or part of what Jesus was showing us when he was washing their feet, that even though their bodies were clean, they would still need to engage in washing their feet. So if we go back to John writing about the vine and the branches, chapter 15, verse three, Jesus says to his disciples, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. And so he's telling them, you have already been cleaned. And interestingly enough, the word translated clean is katharos. And it has the same root of the word translated prune. And that word is kathairo. So you can hear it, katharos, clean, kathairo, prune. To clean is related to the pruning process. In order to clean our hearts, we must be willing to prune them. So Jesus was pointing out that the words he had already spoken to the disciples had already been pruning them. He had been guiding them, training them because they had been abiding with him. They had been remaining with him every day. And every day through his word, he was cleansing them, pruning them. And then he invites them in verse four, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. If we can find ways to remain in the true vine, the true vine that is going to produce good fruit, not bad, we're going to have to remain willing to be pruned. <laughs> because it's the pruning process that cleans us, that, that gets us to that space where our hearts can be purified. And so I want to give all of you a chance to um, talk about what this looks like in your life. Inevitably, the past three months, this COVID season has probably presented some opportunities for you to be pruned, for you to be clean, and so I want to invite you to consider how have you seen God pruning or cleaning you? What has been the hardest part of that process? It's okay if it's hard. <laughs> it usually is. And then what fruit do you see or hope to eventually see growing? Sometimes it takes time. So we may not be at that space yet where we get to see fruit but what fruit are you hoping for? And then same question as last week, how can you practice remaining in the vine in a way that specifically is pursuing the pruning process? Let me pray for us and then I will turn you loose to be able to talk about it with your groups. And then um, I encourage you to pray at the end of that. Dear Father, we just are grateful that you are the true vine, that you were willing to um, step into that role in order to be able to help us to create good fruit. And so I just come before you and just pray 
that you would help us all to be willing to submit ourselves to your pruning process. Um, it's hard to do. And so I just pray that you'd give us all courage for that. Courage to look and be honest about what needs to be pruned and then courage to trust you throughout the process. Jesus, we are grateful. We're thankful for a chance to gather and just pray that you would continue to create good fruit in our lives. In your name I pray, amen. Happy talking, everyone. <laughs>